Welcome, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Vanessa Robbins, who will be speaking to us today about the extended persistent homology transform. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks for the invitation. And thanks very much for the organizers for inviting me to talk in this series. And um, just as a acknowledgement of the cultural circumstances under which I live, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the country that has been traditionally um, managed and looked after by the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in the ACT. And then I'd also like to acknowledge that um, my English culture and the fact that our queen Elizabeth II has just died and now we have King Charles III. So that was kind of momentous news to wake up to this morning. I'm not much of a royalist, but it still kind of marks the end of an era. So um, this talk is really going to be a bit of an infomercial for a paper and our package that Kate and James and I have just finished writing up. And it's about a new variation on the persistent homology transform that incorporates extended persistence. So this is the first time I've talked about this material. Um, and if anything's unclear, please just interrupt me and ask a question um, about any aspect. Um, although I do have to say, I am assuming that everyone in this audience is familiar with the basic idea of persistent homology. So I think that's a pretty safe assumption. Cool. So I'm just gonna make sure that arrows work. There we go. Oh yeah, I don't usually use an overview slide, but just to give you a little roadmap of where we're heading, um, we're gonna start with a kind of brief overview of what the persistent homology transform is, and then move on to describing what extended persistence is. And Kate, Kate is, and I have come up with a new way of um, presenting this material that puts it within the contemporary context of persistence modules. And this allows us to define a Wasserstein distance between extended persistent homology transforms in a particularly nice way. Um, so then I will describe how this extended persistence can be used within the persistent homology transform setup. And as I said in my abstract, although that sounds like it's gonna be a, a lot of extra computational effort, what we've found is and prove in our paper is that you can actually derive this extended persistent homology transform from the information obtained just by computing the regular persistent homology transform over the boundary of the object. Okay, so that's a really very nice result, I think. So for no, no more extra computational work, you get all this extra information. And then I'm hoping to cap off with a demonstration of how this um, transform and the Wasserstein distance between transforms, how that can be used to do shape clustering. And the illustration we're using is just a very cute toy one where we've rendered letters using different fonts and we can distinguish different features of the fonts. So that's kind of cute. So here we have um, just a very brief summary of the persistent homology transform. So what's happening in this um, setup for persistence is that we've got a geometric object. It's a subset of the of Euclidean space. And the way it works is you take a height filtration over that object. So that means you're just computing um, the dot product of each point in our object with a particular direction vector. So that gives us um, the height filtration in a particular direction. And then we look at that height filtration and its persistence diagram for every single direction vector, okay? And that is obviously giving us a huge amount of information about the geometry of the shape. Um, and in fact, it is 
all the information you need to reconstruct an object. So that is something that Kate proves in her paper. So, um, but it is a very, so it's a very powerful and also a very sensitive um, way of quantifying a shape. And it's to the point that if the two persistent homology transforms are the same, then the objects A and B really are the same as subsets of Rn, okay? And so that means identical regions of space. Yep. Um, and then the way we quantify the distance between objects is to take the regular Wasserstein distance between a pair of height filtrations. So we're taking object A and object B, and we're looking at the height filtration in the same direction V for each of them. Okay, so we get two persistence diagrams for that, and we look at their Wasserstein distance. And now we're going to add up the Wasserstein distance over all the direction vectors V. Okay. And that's why this is such a um, very precise quantification of shape. But it does what it does give us is a way to measure distances between shape that does not depend on a kind of landmark analysis. So I guess one of the main strategies in shape comparisons um, is to identify particular feature points that are related to one another in different shapes and then look at distances between those feature points. And so what the homology transform gives us is a method that avoids that um, requirement to identify particular points on this object. And so the little um, picture over here is taken from Kate's paper and it shows that the Wasserstein distance between um, these 2D shapes uh, allows us to perform clustering. So this is a MDS projection of all the pairwise distances between these little pictures up the top. And I guess what I wanted to point out here is that um, the bones are very tightly clustered, right? The bones down here are in red and the fountains are quite tightly clustered up, up here in green. And that's because they all have a similar alignment ink. And the contrast there is with the hammer or the ax actually, I think this is called an ax. So the axes, they all look kind of similar that they have these different orientations. And that's why the orange dots for the axes are rather spread out because this homology transform really is detecting the different orientations of those axes. Now there is also a way to overcome that orientation sensitivity, um, which is to allow, it, well, so here we're comparing distance in direction V with distance in direction V. Um, but what I could do is compare um, object A with direction vector V and then object B with direction vector um, that's offset from V. So you have a constant offset and then you look at minimizing that integrated distance with respect to the offset, okay? And that's the way you can um, remove the sensitivity to different alignments of the object. So, um, that persistent homology transform has been applied in all sorts of different contexts, and it's been demonstrably useful for um, helping in a variety of challenging geometric questions. Um, but there is one major shortcoming, and that is that if A and B have different um, essential homology, so if their Betty numbers are different, then this Wasserstein distance between them becomes infinite, okay? So um, just to get everybody's favorite topology joke in here, the distances between each pair of these shapes will be bounded, right? And it's gonna vary continuously as we move through that sequence. But 
Um, if I look at my two letter G's over here, the fact that this one on the right has a little break at the end of the tail means that this G has one cycle, whereas the G on the left here has two cycles and, or you know what I mean, two homology classes. And so their distance becomes infinite. All right, and this is what our extended persistence homology transform is going to solve. Cool. So in, um, we're gonna, as I said, we're gonna put the concept of extended persistence into the um, context of persistence modules. So the next few slides are just going to be setting up that, that mathematical formulation. Um, so we have here a persistence module over a field. And this module is going to consist of some parameter space, which typically what you're all familiar with will be the real numbers. And then for each real number, we have a vector space. All right. And then there'll be, you know, there's many possible ways to come up with this vector space. And in persistent homology, we use obviously the homology groups of dimension K. And then we have transition maps between um, the vector space at parameter alpha and the vector space at parameter beta, whenever alpha is less than or equal to beta. So in persistent homology, these are the group homomorphisms induced by inclusion. And because we're going to be looking at height functions, and typically we're looking at lower level sets. So um, V alpha will be the homology of the lower level set of our function F, the pre-image of, yeah, right? So we're just taking our snail object here and we're um, looking at lower level sets as the um, threshold increases through that set, okay? And in this particular example, of course, we have one essential class in dimension zero, that's the connected component. We have one um, finite lifetime homology class associated with this little tail. And then we have one essential class in dimension one, which is the whole. Okay, <clears throat> now moving towards in extended persistence, the um, original definition was made for manifolds and it looked at um, this persistent homology sequence of lower level sets. And then um, when you get to the whole space, you then a join, because we're working with a manifold, we know that the um, homology of the lower level sets is the homology of M. And we they use a couple of um, duality results, Poincaré and Lefschetz duality, to then kind of flip everything around and to start looking at the relative persistent homology of upper level sets, okay? So the second part of the extended persistent homology sequence uses relative homology. So I'm just gonna set that up briefly here. Um, so in relative homology, we're, we're looking at um, a pair of spaces. So Y is going to be the larger space. And in our context, we're really looking at the whole manifold or the whole object M. And we're looking at M relative to its upper level sets. So we have to, look at cycles in M, but relative to everything in the upper level set being basically collapsed to a point, okay? And um, where do we wanna focus here? Yeah, so for our extended persistence, our vector spaces are going to be homology of M relative to this upper level set and the homomorphisms are still induced by inclusion, but they're now um, inclusion of a pair, okay? 
Um, so what happens when we start looking at this relative homology is now our alpha parameter starts out at a large value and alpha, the threshold is now going to be decreasing, okay, back through the manifold M. So now we're sweeping um, backwards. I wonder if this helps. All right, so now our, our parameter is going this way. Um, and so in the, for this little example, again, we have one essential class in dimension zero. Okay, so um, in zero dimensional homology, M relative to any part of M basically gives you the reduced homology. Okay, so that's why our zero dimensional class dies here. Um, and then our one dimensional cycles, we, we obtain a one dimensional cycle when we look at M relative to something below F here. Okay, because we've collapsed this part of M and this part of M into a point. Okay, so now we get a cycle. Um, and that cycle dies once we've swallowed it up at G. And the essential one cycle dies once, once again, once the upper level set has swallowed everything up at H. Okay. So what we're going to do now is put these two things together. Okay. Oh, I think I can't advance when I'm annotating. And my cursor has disappeared. Cursor. Oh, there you are. Okay. I think I need to use the pen so I can see where my cursor is. No. There we go. <laughs> Maybe I won't do that again. Okay. Um, okay, so the extended persistence module we have now is we're going to put together the lower level set filtration here. And then we're going to kind of imagine our upper level set filtration as being just a, an extra addition to our parameter space, okay? So our parameter space is going to be called theta. And now instead of being the real numbers, it's a totally ordered set consisting of um, the parameters that sweep through our upper level set, lower level sets, and then the parameters that sweep through the upper level sets, okay? Um, and then, the ordering is exactly as you see it illustrated here. Okay, so every, um, it's exactly as you see it, basically. I won't try and garble my words. And now our, the vector spaces in our module are going to be um, homology of a pair because the sweeping through the lower level sets here, the first half of the sequence, um, the homology is going to be the lower level set relative to the empty set, right? And then as we keep going, we get M relative to the um, upper level sets here, okay? So now we've just got a single sequence and it's all behaving very nicely with respect to a single parameter sweeping through, okay? So our parameter alpha is now a real number with a flag to tell me whether I'm in the ordinary part or the relative part. And then um, we can show that the extended persistent homology module decomposes into four parts, just as you might be familiar with. If you're familiar with extended persistence, you'll know that it has these four parts to it. Um, so first of all, we get the ordinary part, which has the um, the intervals that have a finite lifetime. And then we get the relative part, which are the intervals with a finite lifetime in the relative homology part of the sequence. And then we have the essential classes. Okay, so the essential classes now have, also have a finite lifetime, right? We no longer, we've gotten rid of our infinity by gluing the 
ordinary and the relative parts together. So the essential zero cycles, um, this one is born at A and then it dies when the relative homology starts collapsing out the connected component here. So this, um, and then the one cycle is born in the ordinary part and dies in the relative part once it's been swallowed up, okay? So essential classes will always have a birth in the ordinary part and a death in the relative part. And the difference between the positive and the negative ones is that the positive ones, um, if you look at the, the real number part of their parameter, the birth, the B is actually less than the D value, so just as for the connected component here. Whereas if we're in the negative part of the essential classes, our value for the birth, right, the threshold here on the birth is actually a larger number than the threshold at the death, okay? So if we just look at B and D as real numbers. All right, so is that making sense to everybody? Did people have questions about any of that? No, good, okay. So now we're gonna talk about how to define a Wasserstein distance properly for this sort of persistence module. And it's pretty straightforward really. We're just looking at our, okay, to define this Wasserstein distance, we need a way to compare the endpoints of our intervals. We need, and then we need a transportation plan that um, matches into, intervals with other intervals, yeah. And then we're gonna need a way to cost that transportation plan, all right? So we start by looking at the distance between our endpoints. And this is really exactly what you would imagine. It's just the real number difference, okay, between the real number values. So if the birth and the death are, sorry, if the two coordinates we're comparing are both in the ordinary part of the parameter space, it's just the distance between S and T. If they're both in the relative part of the parameter space, it's their distance. And if we try and compare an ordinary with a relative thing, it's going to be infinite, okay? So that is hopefully sensible and natural to you. Our transportation plan is then going to be just like your normal Wasserstein distance for persistent homology. Um, so we take, we've got our two sets of intervals and our transportation plan is going to be a bijection for some subset of those intervals in each case, yeah. And then we allow the points that aren't being matched um, to go to something we're gonna call ephemeral elements, okay? So in regular persistence, the, the, points, the points in the persistence diagram that you leave out get matched with the closest thing on the diagonal, right? And things on the diagonal are really just intervals with zero length, okay? And so in our extended persistence module, we're going to be, we have to define what our intervals of zero length are, okay? And these are what we call ephemeral intervals or ephemeral elements. And so these are gonna consist of basically zero length intervals in the ordinary part, zero length intervals in the relative part. And then we'll say that a, so now we need to quantify what, what a zero length object in the essential classes would be. And they're going to be um, essential classes that have their real parameter of birth and real parameter in the death being the same value as well, okay? So what this means is that um, if we're just thinking about height functions across an object, if I had like a single pixel speck of dust on my 
domain, then that single pixel speck of dust will be an essential class, but its birth and death values will be almost the same thing. Okay, so they're going to be the ones that can be um, mapped to zero easily. Vanessa, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So, um, um, you know, let's say in your ordinary persistence, it doesn't go up to infinity, but you have a natural like maximum value, right? Mm -hmm. And you had a natural minimum. So if you tried to define the distance between S ord and, and T relative, you know, as sort of like the mm -hmm. distance from S to that maximum, and then, you know, similar for T, I assume that would that would break things. Is that right? It wouldn't work or-, or, or would Yeah, it? yeah, because, well, I guess in that like speck of dust kind of example, um, it, that means the the value associated with that speck of dust. It's an essential class, and its um, lifetime would depend on like how far away it is from the maximum value for the set. Uh, I see. Yeah. yeah. So um, if I had right, I've got my my object here. Uh -huh. And then I've got some little, if my speck of dust was here, then it would have a very short, if my vector's going that way, all right, then the, um, the bar would be kind of coming out here and then coming back again, yeah? yeah? You're trying to measure the length of that, I guess. Although it wouldn't, it wouldn't go that far, obviously, because it's kind of at the maximum. So this one would have a short lifetime, but if my speck of dust was back here, right, then it would have a very long lifetime because it would go all the way up there and then all the way back again. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, so under this setup, these little specks will have a very short lifetime. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so now the cost, okay, is um, related to what Henry was just talking about. The cost of our transportation plan is going to be just a sum of distances between intervals. All oh, right, and we're doing this all with a, you know, an LP weight. Um, so the distance between two intervals is going to be the p-weighted um, distance between birth values and then the death values. Okay, so we're just we're always comparing birth endpoints and death endpoints, and we're just adding them up so that we get um, our distance between intervals is just like how much you have to move the birth and how much you have to move the death, and then. Um, we're allowed to, oh man, why do I move? How do I? I lose my mouse when I'm annotating here. Okay, here I am. So I'm gonna clear and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna leave annotations. Come on. Why aren't you leaving? There we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we've got our, um, so our cost for the transportation plan is gonna be adding up the distances between all the intervals that are paired under the bijection. And then we're going to look at all the unpaired intervals and we're gonna match them to something in the ephemeral set, okay? So this is just like matching things to the diagonal basically. And we're doing that for the unpaired intervals in P and then the unpaired intervals in Q. There we go. Um, and then finally, okay, Wasserstein just takes the, the smallest cost out of all possible transportation plans, right? Nice and easy. And then with this definition, we, we now can derive the fact that this 
Wasserstein distance just breaks down into the sum of Wasserstein distances between each of those four parts of the extended persistent homology module. Okay, so I think previously um, people kind of did the decomposition of the extended persistence module and then said, oh, we're just going to decompose it into the four parts and then add up distances on the four parts, um, putting it in this kind of slightly broader theoretical setup means that the fact our Wasserstein distance breaks down into four parts um, comes out as a consequence of the way we've set things up. Okay. All right, so that's, now we get a few more pictures again. That's the end of all the heavy mathematical notation. Um, so let's look at how we might be able to calculate this extended persistence module. Okay, so I'm just gonna focus on um, subsets of the plane um, because I can draw nice pictures for those. <laughs> and we've implemented this as an R package for binary digital images. So you have to, it's just a definition of a, it's a pixel grid and the pixels are black or white. Okay, so one is the foreground, one belongs to the object and the other is the background, which does not belong to the object. Okay, and then we're going to calculate the extended persistence for each height direction. So I'm trying to illustrate that there with this little GIF. And given two such sets, um, we obtain a distance between their extended persistent homology transforms by, as I said, integrating over all the directions. Okay, and I didn't like the form, if you write this out as a mathematical description, it like takes it's the entire width of the slide. So I was going to spare you that bit of notation that it is in the paper. And then all those nice results about the persistent homology transform carry over to this setting with the extended persistent homology transform. Okay. <clears throat> so um, yeah, it's all very good. And now we get to the relief interesting part, which is the fact that we can derive the extended persistent homology from what well, we derive the extended persistent homology transform just by knowing the regular persistent homology on the boundary of the object. Okay. So this is um, illustrating to you how um, you can obtain particularly for a height function, um, you can obtain the extended persistence pairs for M, the solid object, just by looking at the regular homology um, on its boundary, okay? So this is all about understanding how the births and deaths are associated with particular critical values and critical points, um, and then understanding the nature, how the nature of those critical points changes depending on whether we're in the boundary or whether we're in the object M, okay? So the proofs are quite detailed and um, required setting up concepts for Morse theory on manifolds with boundary. And Kate has done a beautiful job putting all that together, like drawing on literature from quite a few different areas. And I guess part of what makes the way um, that's presented, what the way it make, what part of what makes it nice is that she's developed the definitions um, so that they hold both for um, continuous smooth manifolds and also piecewise linear setting so that it carries over into our computational world. Okay. Um, all right, so if we just look at the regular homology on the boundary of M, okay, obviously we have a birth here at the global minimum. We have another birth at a local minimum. We have a death at a local maximum. 
all right, that causes the merge of these two components. We keep moving through, and then at point P, we get another birth of a connector component, and this one merges um, with the larger original component at Q, and then we keep moving through, and we see another local maximum, and that is the birth of the one cycle, okay? Um, and when we look down at M, okay, we have our original birth at the global minimum. We get another component born here at X, which merges at Y, okay? So the, for this X and Y, we have the same, uh, exactly the same interval, okay? But now when we come over to P, um, this thing that was a birth for the boundary is no longer anything change at all in M. Yeah, so there's no change in the connectivity of M at P or Q. Nothing happens to M at Q. And then when we get to the global maximum, um, well, again, there's no change in topology happening there for M. Okay. Um, but what does happen is that, okay, so what's the difference between X and P, okay? The critical difference here is that um, X is a local minimum on the boundary and it is also a local minimum for M, the height function on M, yeah? Whereas P is a local minimum on the boundary, but it is not a local minimum with respect to M, right? Pretty trivial observation when you draw it out on the plane like that. Um, and so what we, the basic test, the computational test we've implemented is to say, is to check for a lo for local minima on the boundary, whether or not, in fact, they really are local minima for the solid object. All right, so that's the little extra bit of information we need um, to add to the persistent homology all over the boundary. Okay, and once we know that little bit of extra information, we can figure out whether our int where an interval from the boundary belongs in the extended homology of M. Okay. And so you, you said solid object. So I'm correct mm -hmm. to assume that uh, you want, if you're in N dimensional space, you want M to be an N dimensional manifold with boundary. Is that right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I guess solid object, it is allowed to have holes. Okay. So, um, and we have to treat each boundary component of M, okay? And the interior boundary components um, have the same effect. Okay, so here, right, um, local minimum in dimension zero gives you something in the ordinary homology for M. Here we had an interval where this birth was not um, a local minimum for M, but what we know is that in the relative homology part of the extended sequence, okay, this, this point Q is going to correspond to the birth of a relative homology class, which will die when we come to P, okay? So the, the interval associated with P and Q is D to E, and that interval, um, so the interval DE is in pH zero for the boundary and the interval E, E relative and D relative is in the relative one dimensional homology for M, okay? So you have to be careful about what happens to the endpoints of our intervals. And then, so it's the essential cycles that behave a bit differently depending on whether we're an exterior curve or an interior boundary curve, okay? So for an exterior boundary curve, um, we have two essential cycles here, the zero and the one dimensional. And we know that that is going to give us a essential zero cycle for M whose birth is at A and death is at F, okay? So that A and F are gonna be the, the global min and global max for um, that particular component of the boundary. 
Um, now, if we're looking at an interior curve, the finite lifetime objects behave in the same way. So we still um, have to check that um, critical point and see whether it's a local minimum for M or not. So here U is a local minimum for M. So we, we know the interval U to W is part of the ordinary homology for M. But now, um, because it's an interior curve, we know it's creating a hole basically in our object M. And so the global minimum and global maximum of this interior curve become the birth and the death of the essential one cycle in M, all right? So born at K, so the zero cycle is born at K, the one cycle is born at N, and the essential class for the main object M has the interval from N in the relative to, oh no, N in the ordinary parameter and K, N in the ordinary parameter, K in the relative parameter space. Okay. So hopefully this has convinced you that it's not actually too much extra work to get extended persistent homology from regular persistent homology on the boundary. Um, this little part here is oh, just demonstrating how, because we're doing the homology transform, right? We need to look at um, direction vectors in lots of different directions. And so if we, if we know that um, if we choose our direction vectors so that we've always got V and minus V paired up, okay, then we can actually, we don't even have to compute the filtration for um, minus V because we can use these duality and symmetry results to just um, deduce the intervals for the negative V direction directly from the positive V direction. Okay, so that's pretty cute. Um, and yeah, I think that I will move on to the final part of the talk, which is talk, which is just giving you this nice little example of um, shape clustering. Okay, so this is a bit of fun. And we started by looking at capital letter A rendered in a bunch of different fonts. So we chose 95 for some reason. So um, each letter is rendered in a font with the same um, point, font point size. And I guess you could notice that just because you have the same definition of point size does not mean you've got the same actual physical size. That's maybe the first thing to observe. Um, and also the weird thing about fonts is that they have slightly different placements of letters with respect to a baseline. So different within a font, you have a definition of a baseline, which is where the letter sits relative to the imaginary line in your, on your page. And so different fonts might sit in a slightly different plate position relative to that baseline. Okay. So we took account of the shifting around in the baseline by centering the data. So there's a way, a method to center your persistence diagrams. It's basically aligning objects um, with respect to their convex hull. Um, but we don't scale them because they've officially got the same point size. And so the actual physical size is some way of um, quantifying variation in the fonts, okay? And you might think the letter A is pretty boring and doesn't have an interesting topology to it, except that little hole in the top. But um, we've got this one particular font that's a kind of outline um, style. So that does actually have these two extra holes in it, right? In the long stem and then the short little foot. And then the chalk duster font is a kind of has a bit of a speckled effect. So I don't know if you can see, but there's a few little white pixels inside the black ones. And then there's 
maybe one or two disconnected black pixels that are disjoint from the rest of the letter. Okay, so there is there are some different essential homology classes about these letters, which would mean the regular transform um, would assign them infinite distance to all the others. And then the kind of the main two main categories of fonts are the serif fonts like Times New Roman and the sans serif fonts like Arial. Okay, so they're your two very familiar examples. All right, so let's see how we go. Isn't that cool? So we've just done, we calculated all the pairwise distances. And for this plot, we're showing um, the L, like the L2 style. So this we're squaring distances between interval endpoints. Um, and then we've, this is just your 2D um, multi-dimensional scaling embedding of all the, that pairwise distance matrix. We use 32 directions for our transform. And we get this lovely, um, pretty much separation between the serif and the sans serif, right? So the serif ones are in blue, sans serif are in red. The outliers kind of make sense. This A up the top is, is the smallest one out of the family. And this one down the bottom here is the largest. And it also has the largest opening at the top of the A. Um, What else did I want to say? Oh, that those two kind of the fonts that had the funny um, essential classes, you know, are just sitting nicely inside their their um, families of fonts, right? So chalk duster is thirty two. It's sitting nowhere strangely, and academy engraved over here is just nicely in the middle of all its other serif fonts. And then the next letter we looked at was the letter G, and that's because it has, gen right, so the serif version. Oh, so I guess serif and sans serif aren't really the main categories for the different types of letters G. The difference is between whether you have the round, the bowl, and then just a hook at the bottom for your letter G. So that's Arial, that's how we would do handwritten G um, versus the G, this kind of squiggly Gs. I don't know where they came from, but this is called double story G because it's got the bowl and then it's got another bowl in the tail. Okay, so this is a double story G and this is a single story G. And then in our two unusual fonts, um, chalk duster here, hasn't even made the connection across at the bottom. And so chalk duster, well, it's got lots of speckle noise, so it's gonna have lots of very tiny essential one cycles, but it doesn't have any in the large essential one cycles. And then Academy Engraved has, right, all these extra one cycles from its outline shape style, okay. So let's see how we go here. Ta-da, everything's making lovely sense. Um, our outliers are Academy Engrave because it's got all these extra homology classes here. So I think in the letter A, they were mostly ordered by um, size and aspect ratio, and maybe the size of the hole in the A. Um, whereas in the Gs, they seem to be a bit, this pairwise distances seem to be a bit more dominated by the um, essential, the fact that you've got um, one essential class in the single story G versus the two essential classes in the double story G. And then, you know, this funny one that has a little break in the tail here occurs, you know, at one end of the double story Gs and close to the single story Gs, which I think is beautiful. It's all making perfect sense. Oh, and our, our outliers down the bottom here are of course the weirdo chalk duster G and then copper plate for some reason, which uses, I think small caps. So even though it's the lowercase letter, it's written in a small cap style. So it doesn't have any one cycles at all. 
So um, the data for those letter A's is part of the vignette for this R code package. So if you're familiar with R, you can download it all and have a little play for yourself. Um, the paper's on archive. It's got all the details and theoretical foundations for everything I've presented today, including um, a bunch of, well, the description of how we ex how we define the boundary curves from a binary image. I think that's quite a nice, um, that's kind of a nice little part of the story that I didn't go into today. Um, and yeah, the main, the main takeaway is that this XPHT is computable from just the regular persistent homology transform of the boundary and enables us to do shape comparison on objects with different essential homology. Thank you very much. That's all I've got to say. You can all uh, run off home to dinner. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, I wanted to suggest that we all unmute ourselves and uh, give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah. Are there questions? Uh, I can stop sharing my screen, or I don't know, it depends if someone wants to see, well, see some of the slides. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask you a question. So um, I wish I knew this better, but I'm curious um, what types of stability results, if any, might there be, you know, so you, uh, there's these really cool injectivity results. And then I guess with the standard persistent homology transform, you couldn't really have a stability with respect to, say, the Hausdorff distance because you know breaking a hole mm. or not would, mm -hmm. would change it by an infinite amount. Is there any hope for some sort of stability with this extended persistence, say with respect to Hausdorff or something sort of analogous or similar? Or? Um, yes and no, because it depends where the break happens, really. Huh. So I think um, because our Wasserstein distance. If we go back, can I go back? Um, it's using Wasserstein, not a bottleneck, I guess. Oh, you can do bottleneck as well. I just, I see. you know, there was too much to write down. Bottleneck also works. I see. You just cool. do the infinity soup. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Infinity. Bottleneck. yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? Yes, okay, so because you are breaking down, the Wasserstein distance does break down into these four parts, okay? And so we really do compare ordinary with ordinary, relative with relative, and then the essential, two different types of essential classes with each other. So um, I guess if you had a really long line and you broke it in half by chopping a little bit out of it, okay? you're gonna go from having one big essential class to two smaller essential classes, yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, and so that kind of chopping out, I don't think that's particularly, right? There's, you don't really have stability there with respect to house stop distance. That's sure, what I'm trying to say. Sure, yeah. sure. But I think if, right, on the other hand, if you had um, just a single pixel, like if you had a black region with a single white pixel missing, okay, then that single white pixel is giving you a very tiny essential class. And so that could be paired to the boundary, right? And disappear. Huh. And so, yeah, we have, to, we have to study that in more detail, that kind of stability. So what 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 yeah what is we have bed we have some stability with respect to some um, changes to the essential classes but we haven't worked through the details of exactly what that is yet. That that'll be super interesting. And so then yeah. th then another question. So um, you showed this A that had um, the standard hole, but then this extra long thin hole. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so. Um, I was curious, like, um, so if I compared that 
to sort of the same A, but I, I fill the long skinny diagonal hole, you know, how would that affect the extended persistence um, transform? So is it is it roughly roughly appropriate to say, well, when you sweep from these different directions, you're sort of measuring the size of that hole in, in different directions. Mm -hmm. So maybe from some directions, the hole is quite large, but others it's quite small. So overall, when you integrate, it's some notion of the size of that hole that, that appears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think like Academy Engraved and Times New Roman are pretty pretty similar, except for those, those bits that have been array, you know, the outline versus the solid. And so Academy Engraved is number one, which is hidden in here. And then Times New Roman is 85, which is just hidden in here. And so they are, you know, pretty close by. Right, because that's and, a very thin hole, sort of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, so Don, Don's got a question. Hi, Don. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> Thanks for joining Thanks very in. much. Thanks very much. Yeah. That was really exciting. Yeah, uh, I'm you. thinking, yeah, I'm thinking um, in regards to applications, and this may be a little bit naive, but um, just think of uh, a data set uh, with, say, mm -hmm. 20 variables. And if you can map these variables into a shape, for instance, you might want to draw um, a, a radar plot or a, or a spider plot. You imagine the circle, say, divided into 20 uh, intervals mm -hmm. yep. and from the center to the boundary uh, is a normalized distance for some variable some measurement mm -hmm. so you've got this, mm -hmm. right and then you join them all up okay and you've got this funny shape that's yeah yeah uh, I've seen particular particular like to one yeah. row and represents whatever you're looking at um so and you'd have all these different shapes but obviously there'd be commonalities mm -hmm. between them and differences if if it's possible to feed that shape into your um into your R package here, would that yeah. be able to do clustering and say so get an idea of uh, similar shapes, which would uh, then translate to similar uh, profiles in, in those variables? You know? Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, I hadn't thought so of that. So, how would I feed that into the package? Would I have to take a, a photo, <laughs> a screenshot, or something? And I, just feed that um, <laughs> no, you could do it as a just as the boundary, you can define the piecewise linear boundary. Yes. Yep. Yep. And we can take just that boundary curve as our input. Okay, so actually define it, mm -hmm. all right. And yeah. uh, for the package to read it. Okay, I'll, I'll let you Ooh. know how it goes. <laughs> cool. Yeah, happy to talk about it more with you too. Yeah. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, well, um, I'm going to, I need to end the recording here, but um, mm -hmm. I'll do that. And everyone is welcome to stick around and ask a few more questions as well. So, yeah.